ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to see is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. This is the city. from downtown. Steel and stone and two million people. They produce everything for the millions. They use it up for the millions. And they waste it the same way. Every month they throw away thousands of dollars worth of everything. Some of them waste food and water. Some of them waste time and money. And some of them just waste themselves. When they do, I pick up the pieces. I'm a cop. It was Sunday, March 9th. We were working the day watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Ed Jacobs. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 4.35 p.m. when we got to the Kelsey apartments. The call came in a half hour before. A man reported the fatal shooting of his wife. We didn't know how it happened. We didn't know why it happened. The husband claimed it was suicide. The evidence pointed to murder. Woman's dead. Shot to the right temple with a 45 automatic. Husband claims it was suicide. What's the name? Mr. and Mrs. Andrew Robertson. Wife's name is Marie. That's Mr. Robertson in the front room there. Crime lab been called? They're on their way. I guess we better talk to Robertson. Right. Mr. Robertson, Sergeant Jacobs, Sergeant Friday. How do you do? How are you? Mr. Robertson, you want to tell us what happened here? <sighs> Just gotten back from the corner grocery store. My wife and I had a little argument going. It started before I left for the store. Still on when I got back. I see. She was fixing chicken fried steaks for dinner. Putting flour on them. We had a few more words and I went over and sat on the Davenport right where I am now. Mm -hmm. She was standing here in the doorway to the kitchen. She said something that set me off. I guess I got pretty mad and said a few things. Then she went over that little nightstand there by the door to the kitchen. That's where I keep my army automatic. She pulled it out of the drawer and backed into the kitchen. Put the gun to her head and said, this will put an end to the argument once and for all. I yelled at her and tried to stop her, but I was too late. She pulled the trigger and fell right there where she is. What'd you do then? I went upstairs to Ted Carlton's place. He lives in 212 right above us. We don't have a phone here. I asked him to call the police and send for an ambulance. Did you go over to see how badly your wife was shot? Yes, I forgot to tell you. The minute she fired, I rushed right over to her, but it was too late. She was dead. Did you touch anything in here? Move anything? No, sir. Not a thing. I've been right here ever since I got back down from Ted's room upstairs. Joe? Empty cartridge casing here on the floor. Yeah. Well, when Jones gets here, we can measure the distance. Just a minute. saucer over till the crime lab gets here. Huh? Right. Hi, Jones. Harry. Hello. Oh. Lee, kitchen. Harry, I wonder if you'd mind taking Mr. Robertson downtown. We'll be right down as soon as we finish up here. Right, Joe. See you later. Thanks, sir. Shot through the right temple. Husband claims suicide. Uh-huh. What's under the saucer? Empty casing. Looks like she was flouring meat, huh? That's what the husband says, yeah. That's probably what that is on the barrel of the automatic there. Yeah, we noticed that. Waste baskets are full, isn't it? Mm hmm Light tempo, huh? Mm hmm 45 automatic. Yeah. 
If she shot herself from the kitchen, the position of the body doesn't warrant the empty casing being out there in the living room, does it? George. Yeah. Come in. Friday. Jacobs. How are you, George? Hi. Right. What do you want to shoot? Why don't you get an overall of the room first and then grab one in the kitchen there? Yeah, all right. Can I get this sauce off the casing for you, George? Thanks. Okay. Jacobs, you mind moving over there a little? Oh, yeah. Thanks. What do you want now, the kitchen? All right. Right from where you are now is good. Okay. Now, right over the body. Yeah, all right. Better get that chair to stand on. Yeah, here you are. Thanks, Ed. Not much room to work in here. Can you get it all in there? Yeah, I think so. Better use the wastebasket as your right-hand side line. Kitchen stove on the other side. Right. Can't get the stove in. Uh, you settle for the wastebasket only? Fine. Just use that as your right hand side line. Right. Okay. Hey, Lee, when you finish up here, Ed and I are going to run upstairs. Well, Joe, before you go, do you want to give me a hand? Take over this end. Sure. Fine. Where do you want it? Right to about where she must have been standing. About here? That's good. Uh-huh. Thanks. You bet. Okay, we'll check you later, Lee. Fine. All right, Sally. Friday, Jacobs, how is it? Rough one. officers. You're Mr. Carlton? Yes, I am. It's an awful thing, isn't it? We understand you're a friend of the Robertsons. Yes, I am. You found out anything yet? You think Andy killed her? We don't know. We haven't completed our investigation. Oh, I see. Well, I'll bet that's the way it was. I hate to say that, but from all the indications, it certainly looks that way. How do you mean? The argument, the shouting, and then that single shot. I don't know. It sure struck me that Andy did it. When did the argument start? Was it prolonged, do you know? What do you mean? When did it start? What time, do you know? Well, this one today started about 3.30 when Andy got back from the store. They've been arguing ever since I've known them. How long have you known them? About two years. Those two never should have gotten married to begin with, if I'm any judge. You married? No, sir, I'm not. I wonder if you can tell us. Did Mrs. Robertson ever say anything that would lead you to believe that she was in fear of her life? Well, yes, she did. One time Andy stalked out of the apartment down there and Marie came up here to see me. She was in tears, all broken up about it as usual during those spats. I see. She said, uh, I'll try to remember exactly how she put it. She said, uh, Andy gets so mad sometimes, I think he's going to kill me. What do they usually argue about, you know? Mm, different things. This particular time I was telling you about, I think, was over as being late for dinner. I see. Now, aside from this one instance, is there anything else you can offer us? Well, Andy has a terrible temper, that I know. We used to go out and bowl once in a while, Marie, Andy, and myself. We had to stop. Every time he missed a spare, you'd think it was the end of the world. Would he usually seem to take it out on his wife? Most of the time, yeah. Although I must say I caught it myself a few times. Abusive language. He really carried on over nothing at all. Did Robertson leave his wife home alone much of the time? No, not any more than usual. Seems like he always wanted to get home just so they could argue. Everybody in the apartment house knows about him. Now, you said that Mrs. Robertson came up here after that one particular argument. That's right, sir. Did she come up here often? No, not very often. Just when she was unusually upset and her nerves were on edge. 
But only then when Andy'd rush out mad. Do you know whether or not Robertson owns a gun? Yes, I believe he does. As a matter of fact, I know he does. One night we were having trouble with prowlers. He came up here with his automatic. I see. Later on, I think I asked him where he got the gun. He said from the Army. Anything else you can add, Mr. Carlton? Well, I was the one to call the police. You knew that. That's what we understand. Well, didn't Andy tell you? He came up here right after the shot and asked me to call the police for him. They don't have a phone. Exactly how did he tell you? Well, what do you mean? Well, what were his exact words? Can you remember? He said, my wife shot, call the police and get an ambulance quick. What was your reaction to this? Well, I'd heard the shot, so I wasn't too surprised. When Andy came running up here, I knew before he said a word, you could tell just to look at him. You could tell what? That something was wrong. I had a hunch all along that this might happen one day. What's that? That Andy killed his wife. <laughs> Carlton let us use his telephone. I called the coroner and then I checked with R&I. There was no previous record on Andrew Robertson nor his wife, Marie. Ed and I continued questioning the various neighbors in the apartment building. Their stories all matched in every detail. The Robertsons had been known to argue quite frequently and quite loud. None of the neighbors could definitely say that they had ever heard Andrew Robertson threaten his wife. All of them volunteered it would be entirely possible. We went back to the interrogation room where we questioned the suspects for a full hour. Everything I've told you was the truth. Would you mind going over just once more? All right. We had our quarrels and our arguments. I guess some of them were pretty bad. But I'd never do a thing like this to Marie. You don't seem very upset about all this, Robertson. I'm not crying about it, if that's what you mean. I'm sorry she had to do it. I tried to stop her, but there was nothing I could do. You seem to be taking all this pretty well under the circumstances. I don't know if I can explain how I feel about it. You see, Marie and I weren't too happy the last couple of years. We've been married eight years, and I guess from the start we could never hit it off. Did you used to argue quite a bit? No, not at first we didn't. It just seemed that we've drifted apart the last couple of years. Seem to fight all the time over nothing at all. I honestly believe we fell out of love. Would you mind telling us again exactly what happened this afternoon? First of all, when I got up, I always liked to sleep in on Sundays. She asked me to go to the store. That started the argument. She knows I don't like to do the shopping. It seemed like she was always forgetting something and I'd have to go. Mm -hmm. When I got back from the store, she was making chicken fried steaks for dinner. She's putting the flour on the meat. We argued back and forth for a minute, and then she stepped into the living room. I went over and sat on the Davenport. Go on. We had a few more words, and she went over the small nightstand by the kitchen door and took out my army automatic that I kept in there. She backed up into the kitchen and pointed the gun at her head. Yeah. She said, this will end the argument once and for all. As I said, I was on the Davenport about 12 feet away from her. I yelled at her. What'd you say? I said, Marie, put that gun down. It's loaded. Before I could reach her, she pulled the trigger. Then what'd you do? I rushed over to her, but it was too late. She was dead. What happened then? We don't have a phone, so I rushed upstairs to the apartment right above us, Ted Carlton's. I asked him to phone for the police and the ambulance. Did you tell this Carlton about your wife? Yes, sir, I did. I told him she'd been shot. Then where'd you go? It's all just like I told you, at the apartment. I went back downstairs and waited in the living room for you people to get there. Go near your wife's body? No, sir, I didn't. Did you always keep that gun loaded? Yes, I did. I always kept it loaded and actuated with a shell in the chamber. But I kept the safety lock on. Marie knew how to operate the gun because I showed her for when I was out late. She wasn't strong enough to actuate it, but she could work the safety. Did your wife ever try to commit suicide before? No, sir, not to my knowledge. Mr. Robertson, are you sure that everything you've told us is the truth? It's the absolute truth, every word of it. Well, now, here's the way it looks to us. We think you killed your wife. I didn't. Let us lay a few things out for you. We talked to your friends and neighbors in the apartment house. We have people who will testify to the fact that your wife was afraid that you might kill her. She told one man that. It isn't true. I don't know what she may have told somebody, but I didn't kill her. It's a known fact throughout the entire apartment building. You and your wife had violent quarrels. Kind of arguments from all reports could easily lead to something like this. I told you that we argued, but I didn't kill Marie. I couldn't do a thing like that. Mr. Robertson, we've made a preliminary investigation of your apartment. Now, you say your wife killed herself. Let me show you some of the flaws in your story. All I can say is that I've told you the truth. I didn't kill her. You told us that your wife went to the nightstand and got the gun. Yes, sir, that's right. How did she pick up the automatic? How do you mean? How did she take it from the drawer? Like anyone would pick up a gun by the butt. She picked it up like anybody who was going to use it. You're sure about that? Yes, sir, positive. She didn't touch anything but the butt? 
Well, she had part of her hand on the trigger. Yeah, we know that. But she didn't touch any other part of the weapon. No, sir, she did not. She didn't have time. Then how do you account for the fact that we found traces of flour on the barrel of the gun? Sure, she was flouring me. How did the flour get on the barrel? I don't know. Isn't it true that when you approached her with the automatic pointed at her, she tried to ward off the shot with her hand? Isn't that how the flour got on the barrel? No, sir, that isn't true. Now, you said that your wife was putting flour on some steaks. That's right. How do you account for the fact that we didn't find any flour on the butt of the gun where it belonged? Or on the drawer of the nightstand where you say she first picked up the automatic? I can't answer that. I don't know what all this means. Well, I'll tell you what it means. It means that unless you've got some kind of explanation, we have to assume you're lying, that you killed your wife. I don't know how to explain all these things, but I didn't kill her. Mr. Robertson, you say you are an Army man. Isn't that what you told us out at the apartment? Yes, sir. I was a sergeant in the Army during the last war. What outfit were you with? I was an instructor in sidearm weapons at Santa Ana Army Air Base. Then you'd be somewhat of an authority on the Colt 45 caliber automatic pistol, wouldn't you? I guess I would, yes. That was one of the weapons I instructed in. You'd know all about the system of ejection employed by the Colt company on their 45 automatic? Yes, sir, I would. The empty casing ejects to the right, up, and back. Is that correct? Yes, that's right. In other words, if you were pointing a 45 at me and you pulled the trigger, the empty casing would eject to your right, up and fall to the floor to the rear on your right side. Is that right? Yes, sir. That's the way it would end up. You still maintain your wife shot herself? Yes, I do. Where was she standing when she pulled the trigger? As I told you before, in the kitchen. How was she standing? What do you mean? Which way was she facing? Well, let's see. Facing me about three quarters. Yes, that's right. In the kitchen near the sink, facing out toward me. And where were you? On the Davenport in the living room, facing her. Now, bearing in mind what we've already discussed and agreed upon concerning the ejection system of a 45, how do you account for the fact that the empty casing was found in the living room, six feet, four inches from the kitchen? Well, let's see. I'll figure it for you. The empty casing should have been found on the floor of the kitchen somewhere to the right and rear of your wife. Isn't that about it? Well, I, I don't understand. Why are you trying to prove me guilty? I've told you and I swear to you, I didn't kill my wife. It'd be a physical impossibility for that empty casing to have landed anywhere but in the kitchen if your wife had pulled the trigger of that automatic. Now, how about it? What can I say? Please believe what I'm telling you. I didn't do it. Not according to the evidence. I don't understand any of this. All right. Here's the way we've got it reconstructed. You had a quarrel. You got the gun. You met your wife at the doorway of the kitchen. You pointed the gun at her. She tried to ward it off with her left hand, leaving flour on the barrel of the gun. You fired, and the casing was thrown up and back to the right where it landed on the rug of the living room. The testimony of the neighbors, the flour on your wife's hand, the position of the empty casing. Robertson, you're it. I don't know why all those things are the way you say they are. We do. We don't believe your wife committed suicide. Come on, Ed. I certainly got him tapped. Yeah, with all that proof, and he still refuses to cop out. Yeah. Something doesn't jive. Gene Bechtel take Andrew Robertson's statement that his wife had committed suicide, a fact that he couldn't prove and that we could disprove. We had before us the final investigation. All physical evidence was taken to the crime lab for analysis. The photographs taken at the scene were developed and brought in for careful checking. Blotter tests were made to determine the distance of the gun from the victim when it was fired. Both Robertson and his deceased wife were fingerprinted and latent prints details started to check them out. Two teams of men were sent out to talk with the close relatives of the two people. Sunday, March 9th, 7 p.m. We got a call from Lieutenant Lee Jones that he had the final results of his investigation. We went over to the second floor of the Central Station, the crime lab. Take a look at this. Picture of the 45 casing, huh? That's right. Take a close look at it. Right here, particularly. Yeah. Notice this one edge is a little indented here. Ejector marks? No, here are your ejector marks up here. You see? This indentation is something entirely different. What is it? You remember where you found this casing? Yeah, six feet four inches into the living room. That's right. We wondered how it could have been thrown that far by the ejector if the husband's story is true. The ejector didn't do that. I wondered too. On closer inspection, I noticed this indentation. Now, let me show you how this casing got there in the living room. Here's an identical 45 caliber cold empty casing. Yeah. We place it on the floor on a piece of linoleum, the same thickness as their kitchen linoleum. Now, 
Now watch this. I'll step on it, hitting it from an angle. There's your answer to that one. Now, when the husband ran over to his wife's side, uh, what did he say he did? That's about the size of it. He stepped on the casing accidentally, certainly not caring about it at the moment, and it bounced out into the living room, just like a tiddlywink. Notice the casing now, the indentation. Check it against the photo. Yeah, it matches. Did the flower on the barrel of the gun, it was flower, by the way, did it figure in for you, fella? Well, we figured the wife was trying to ward off the gun when he pointed it at her. Certainly the logical deduction. Here's that shot of the kitchen out there. Mm -hmm. Notice the wastebasket here? Pretty full, isn't it? Yeah, we noticed that when we were out there. What you probably didn't notice was this. Here's a blow-up of just that section where the wastebasket was. Can you see what's on top of the stuff in the basket there? Yeah, looks like a flour sack. That's right, an empty flour sack. Now, figuring the position of the body in relation to that wastebasket when she dropped the gun, it fell from her hand, striking the wastebasket, bouncing off and landing on the floor where you found it. You said when she dropped the gun, you figure it was suicide? It's beginning to shape up that way, isn't it? There's no flower found on the butt of the gun. That part of the automatic didn't come in contact with the flower sack. Yeah, Lee, but she was flowering meat. There were no traces of it on her right hand, on the palm, just on the back. Checking the clothing, we found streaks of flour where she could have wiped her hands clean before picking up the gun. It doesn't look like he killed her. There's more here. As you know, we ran blotter tests to determine the distance of the gun from the body when it was fired. Shot a 45 caliber Colt from various distances before we got the right answer. Yeah. Here's the results of the tests. Found powder burns on the right side of the wife's head. This test shows that the gun was held approximately three inches from the right temple when it was fired. Mm -hmm. That's it. Here's the report from Leighton Prince. Smudges, one good thumbprint, right hand, belonged to Marie Robertson, indicating she was the last one to handle the weapon. That's about it, Lee? No, I've got some more for you. Now, this shot was taken facing the east wall of the kitchen. That's the wall that would be on anyone's left sitting on the Davenport in the front room. Wouldn't be possible to see that wall from the Davenport. You can see the back X where we located the slug. Mm -hmm. Relative to the position of the body, if she was standing, holding the gun at approximately a right angle with the side of the head, the bullet would come to rest approximately four inches below the crown of her head. To check out? The coroner says she was 5'4". The bullet was found at a height of five and one eighth, proving that she shot herself rather than anyone else doing it, judging from the inclination of the bullet. As you know, this is critical. Yeah. For what it's worth, the condition of the wound indicates that it was inflicted from extreme close range. A fair point when you consider that most people wouldn't submit to being shot from close range without a struggle, or unless taken by surprise. And from all reports, we know she wasn't. Well, that's it, fellas. That's all we have. Thanks, Lee. It's enough. Crime Lab Jones. Yeah, right here. Just a minute. Either one of you. Hey. This is Friday. Oh, hi, Harry. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what's it say? Huh? Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much, Harry. Yes, it sure does. Right. Bye. Hey, Fremont. He just left Marie Robertson's mother. What'd she have to say? Well, Fremont says she gave him a letter. He's on his way in with it, written by Marie Robertson. Says something about her taking her own life. Her mother says that the husband didn't do it. Says that the daughter's shown indication in the past of wanting to take her own life. I had about cinches it. Makes you feel kind of good, doesn't it? Yeah. Finding a man clear on a charge instead of having to hang him up. Yeah. Come on, Ed. Right. Where are you headed? Back across street. Wait till I get my coat. I'll go with you. What for? I want to see him, too, when you tell him. On March 12th, the hearing was held in the office of the coroner, city and county of Los Angeles, state of California. In a moment, the results of that hearing. A dead body report, Form 311, was made out stating that the deceased, Marie Robertson, had committed suicide. 